You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. All set for your flight? Yep, I've got everything I need. Eye mask, neck pillow, T-Mobile, headphones. Wait, T-Mobile? You bet. Free in-flight Wi-Fi. 15% off all Hilton brands. I never go anywhere without T-Mobile. Same goes from a water bottle, chewing gum, nail clippers, okay, passport. Okay, I'm going to leave you to it. Find out how you can experience travel better at T-Mobile.com slash travel. Qualifying plan required. Wi-Fi were available on select U.S. airlines. Deposit and Hilton Honors membership required for 15% discount. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era and fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine and actress-writer Nan McNamara. So, Steve, did Ava Gardner and Howard Hughes have a good relationship? Well, they did until he dislocated her jaw. What? Well, don't worry. She hit him back with an ashtray. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign is the gin joint for you. Recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff, this is Triviality. The cream of the crop! Hello and welcome to Triviality, the game where a lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. I'm Jeff. Joining me in the studio are Ken and Neil. I plan to be very serious today, guys. Yeah, you look very serious you today. You very serious all the time. I'm in a little bit of pain because I took a couple pucks to the body playing uh, playing floor hockey the other day. So uh, Jeff did not beat me up. It's just uh, it's just from the sport. He fell down the stairs. We'll look at the official Put report. my body on the line. We can talk later if you want to tell me the truth, Ken. That's fine. For the love of the game. <laughs> As they say, the truth hurts, right? Uh, yeah. Matt isn't here, unfortunately. Uh, he actually took a, uh, a field He's... trip to the Rachel Ray uh, factory where they make all the pots so you can get at Kohl's. And the dog food. And the, and the dog food. So he's he's learning how to design Rachel Ray um, cookware. And he's coming up with new colors for that. Okay. And uh, I guess he's sourcing his inspiration from Andrew Lloyd Webber's uh, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Okay. So, sure. I mean, the good news for us, though, <laughs> is we do have two LA guests joining us via Skype. To replace him. To replace Matt. That's correct. And they're yep. better than Matt. Just for I would, record. I, I already... Uh, let's already simmer down it. there, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've got, so, uh, Christina Carter and Kevin Adamson joining us today. They are both cruiserweight champions. How are you doing? Hello. Hey, guys. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much I'm for doing joining us. I'm doing pretty well. So, uh, we, Same. it's been established. You're out in LA. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Um, I'm Christina, and uh, I'm a technology consultant um, for a company out here, and... And that's the only interesting fact I can think of right now. That's quite all right. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm a structural engineer out here in California. Um, so, yeah, just to kind of build on uh, Christina's really in-depth background about us, uh, we do a lot of our trivia around here in L.A. Um, we both went to UCLA, and we still kind of live in that area. Um, a lot of great bar trivia out here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been trying to find Matt at random bar trivias. We haven't found him yet, um, but we're working on it. My guess is he doesn't go. Yeah, by I don't himself. think so. <laughs> no, he. Uh, <laughs> if you if you ever want to see Matt, you just have to log into one of those Touch Tunes machines because he's in there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, see, Matt's Matt's purely professional at at trivia. Right. You know what I mean. He only does it's our not show. Not a game to him. And professional. Right, it's not a game. It's not a game anymore. Maybe I'll. This is what I'll do. I'm going to be in LA tomorrow maybe i'll get matt i'll get where they go to trivia and then i'll just surprise matt by bringing him there and tell him to wear a suit <laughs> see what happens we'll have a red tulip as well so you'll know yeah right exactly <laughs> the trivia shop around the corner yeah. jeff right. jeffrey yeah just seeing how you're doing i'm doing pretty well i so just you, wanted to get so, another look at you so you wrote the game today right i did write the game today um so we will uh, get that underway as soon as we get our reading from our rules guy yeah he's gonna do like an la dude yeah that's Straight from good. Southern Surfer. California, ally. Okay. The rules of the game are simple. 20 questions split into two rounds worth 10 points apiece. At halftime, there'll be a special swing round designed by this week's host. After regulation, players will enter the final round with the points that they've accumulated and will have a chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, someone will be named the cream of the crop. I'm talking about all the way to the top yeah that was really good he, he actually did that while merging from the 101 to the 10 <laughs> this is all we know he right? wanted to take it up to mall hall right yeah he took la Brea all the way there to that punchline at the end all right yeah. well uh you, you said uh you guys were feeling a little under the weather today so uh this is gonna be your flu game right 
Yeah. yeah, so this will be our Michael Jordan flu game. So I think that's that'll be our team name. MJ, MJ flu game is what we'll go with. All right, MJ flu game. And what do, what do you want to be? Um, how who are they playing? Uh, who during they, that flu? They're flu playing the game? Jazz. I will be the Jazz. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, Since, how about, uh, you were a Jazz drummer, and uh, I watched. Well, they're MJ flu game. What if we're DJ Utah Jazz? <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> Love it. Love it. It's way too much for me. I think it was the jazz, that. right? Though I could be completely I think so. wrong. I think you're right. They they played I thought a about, lot. I thought about googling that before. I was like, <laughs> I feel like I should know if that's our team name and the question about that pops up. I should know. We're gonna but assume I didn't it, it's so. the jazz. We're gonna assume. Yeah, we're not gonna look it you up. You know who would know? <laughs> Matt. 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 Yeah. And and probably Carl Malone, Jeff Hornacek, and a bunch of other Utah. Jazz. Whether they were in there John or not. <laughs> John Stockton. Yep. All right. So without further ado, question one. Uh, Rutro, after a series of contentious decisions made by this late famous radio DJ's wife, you'd have to fly more than 5,000 miles from his place of birth to visit him in a relatively unremarkable grave in Oslo, Norway. Okay, so... so what do you think is going on here? It's Rutro is Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Uh, and the voice of... Sha- he said... You said uh, radio personality? Radio DJ. Radio DJ. And the guy, the guy who's like, uh, on this week's uh, letters, um, Case Keen... Casey... Casey Kasem? Casey Kasem. That's it. Because he did the voice of Shaggy. Oh, did he? Yeah. Okay. That's a great answer. Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's... You kind of did a Jack Nicholson impression. I did. I, did. I have to get into the... Because <laughs> I'm thinking of, of Case Keenum, who's a quarterback, and it's Casey Kasem. Case, okay. Casey Kasem? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, the right world made me think of Scooby-Doo, which made me think of Shaggy, but I don't know why Shaggy would be... One, I don't know if he's dead. I also don't know if he'd be buried in Norway. Yeah, but we don't know if he was a radio DJ. Regardless, we locked in with Shaggy. Shaggy. Zoinks. Uh, Yeah, we so uh, Ken originally wrote down Wolfman, which was a famous DJ as well. Uh, But what Jeff, when he said Rut Row, made me think of Scooby Doo. Um, Just like they said, it made me think of Shaggy. And the voice of Shaggy was uh, Casey Kasem. Yeah. Uh, the guy who did yeah. all the letters like this week on letters. Uh, I can't. I didn't know that. Famous for all the top 40 countdowns as well. Still creepily playing through the radio speakers, even though he's been dead for a number of years. Casey Kasem. Cool. Nice. That Let's start, sense. Neil. Yeah, I feel good. All right. Question two. Uh, when not programmed thoughtfully, computers have a difficult time differentiating between no data and zero. As a result, a British motorist has received over 12,000 pounds in fines for their license plate, bearing what Anglo-French word, meaning not any, because every time a plate cannot be identified, they're issued a ticket. Uh, yeah, we have no idea on this question, so uh, we're going to tap out, and it's up to you guys. So we are thinking maybe known. I think that's just no in French, but it could be like N, zero, N. But also, I know in math, like N-A-N is, stands for not a number, but I don't think that's French. Should we just do known? Yeah, uh, I was okay. talking with known. We're going to do known, like N-O-N or N, zero, N. And no answer from you guys? We have nothing. Uh, the correct answer is null. Hmm. Like N-U-L-L. No! N-U-L-L. Yep. Oh, like null and void? Yeah, mm-hmm. which is a way of representing yeah. in computer systems like that there is Cody, no data, null. not that yeah. the answer has a zero for a data set. Okay. I do I do want to say null was a great guess there. I didn't even think of that. That was, I would have given you points for that. <sighs> that one hurt. Not my game, though. All right. Apparently, I was on a bit of a uh, word kick here. Uh, question three. Coming from French and translating to social equal, what is another word for nanny? This term is often used in England and posher parts of American society. I think I I know. You good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're We're, good, too. We're locked in, so you guys can start. Oh, okay. We're thinking au pair. We are also thinking au pair. Au pair is the correct answer. Nice. Woo! Every on epi- the board. every episode of like SVU or like Law and Order or all those shows, there's always a subplot of an au pair doing something dirty, like stealing money or jewelry. <laughs> <Is> that so, <laughs> yeah, all the time. Question number four: The Office is probably the best known U.S. adaptation of a British TV series. Many shows, such as Coupling, Broadchurch, and Absolutely Fabulous, had limited to no success as U.S. imports. If the William Shatner reenactment-based TV show, which aired from 1989 to 1996, was originally a British TV show, what would have been the likely name? What are you thinking? Okay, so what I think Jeff is getting at is that the way that um, the British have different ways of saying the same thing, like truck is a lorry or an elevator is a lift. Oh, right. Or an apartment is a flat. Mm-hmm. I think it's probably got one of those words in there, so we need to just convert that into British. All right, we pretty much have absolutely nothing. 
but we refuse to tap should ever. <laughs> yep, I love it. We're just gonna say the boot in case it had trunk in it. It's not bad. We right. said uh, England's most wanted. So the famous Shatner reenactment series was Rescue 911. Oh. So yeah. all you would have to know is uh, in England, for emergency services, you dial 999, or anywhere in Europe, you can dial 112. So I would have accepted right. either Rescue 999 or 112. So we were on the right track there. You were. But in America, if you call 112, peaches and cream plays. It's good to know. That's what? just a deep R&B reference for the <laughs> 90s. Sorry. <laughs> Someone will get it. If you do, write to me and make me feel better. Like... Put a letter in the mail. Love the peaches and cream reference. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be like a month later. I have no idea what it is. All right. Question number five. Which NFL policy, which was named for the former Pittsburgh Steelers owner who proposed and implemented it in 2003 as a means to increase diversity by requiring teams to interview minority candidates before hiring coaches? Recently, the policy came back into the spotlight after Tony Dungy, part of the impetus for this rule, said that people were violating the spirit of the rule. At the time it was proposed, it was found that black head coaches who, despite having a higher win percentage of games, were less likely to be hired and more likely to be fired than their white counterparts. And so what is the name of this NFL policy? I was just hearing about this on the radio, but I forgot, I but Neil knows it, so we're locked in. Mm-hmm. Okay, give us a sec. Um, Fortunately, this is all you. <laughs> I know, and it's come up so much recently. Uh, all I have is Hugh Jackson stuck in my head, but it's not him. Um, the Wolverine rule? The- not oh, Jackman. Shoot. Oh, Hugh Jackson. I think he said Hugh Jackman. <laughs> 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 Well-known football. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's the. It'll be the greatest showman on turf. <laughs> Man, I'm on all. I'm on all that cylinders today. You know what I'll those? Give you that. Yep. Full marks. Yep. Thank <laughs> you. Ten points to Gryffindor for Th- that one. Thank you. Um, <laughs> He's a awful ah, puff. Jeez, it's the um, the Hooney the how. Cuny. Rooney, yeah, it's the Rooney rule. Thank you. Jeez Louise. Rooney rule locked in. What a poll. That was great to watch. Yeah, the uh, the Rooney rule. That is correct. I believe named after nice Dan follow. Rooney after, after he took over operations. After Mickey Rooney. Af- exactly. It was after Mickey Rooney. And his uh, racist turn in uh, Breakfast correct. at Tiffany's. They said if he, can, if he can do that, we cannot do this in the NFL. Right. What's great, I'm glad you put that in the, uh, the question, though, because people kind of abuse that rule. Like, they just don't even take it seriously, which is terrible in the NFL. But, yeah. Well, even worse is they just bring in a coach just to interview him with no intent of hiring him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they have no intention whatsoever. And then they don't, that person doesn't get hired anywhere. Yeah. Get right, NFL. Come on. All right. So after five, we've got 30 points for DJ Utah Jazz. Do I have that right, Neil? That is correct. We are the best radio station for Mormon Jazz. And 20 points for MJ Flu Game. Question six. While traditionally made with alcohol, but widely consumed without, and often utilizing brandy, rum, whiskey, or bourbon, which drink derives its name from part of the old English word for alcohol? The rest of the recipe is rarely changed, with or without alcohol, so at least given the name, whichever alcohol you choose is the right one. Whoa. Yeah, this is kind of confusing to me. I I really don't know. What do you think? I'm not too sure either. I can't really think of of an alcohol that, uh, or drink that would be that versatile. Um, so Long Island iced tea, then it's just an iced tea. Would I don't you know. Mix grog. Oh yeah. What about grog? Just like a mixture of various boozes. Oh yeah. What about like mold wine or mead? Isn't mead like a bunch of different alcohol? Uh, I think mead is just like a like a wine kind of beer, isn't it? Grog. That's fine. I've never heard that, but that that could be a foreign yeah, word. I, I don't know. Let's go with that. Okay. We're, we're gonna say eggnog. Ooh, Ooh that's a really good answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually picked another seasonal drink and we just said gr- grog 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 yep so from the english word nog mm. meaning alcohol eggnog is the oh, correct answer hey. nice answer over there tying it up Ooh. i didn't even i didn't even That's... think about eggnog being non-alcoholic and alcoholic yeah. i i mean i don't drink it i've never had it alcoholically but i didn't realize people used like brandy rum whiskey or bourbon like i didn't realize how oh different. yeah yeah i prefer bourbon <laughs> I've tried, I think I've tried it every way. It tastes exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> so much egg. I've never had it. So so much egg. And now they I'm... have some, like, we tried an almond milk one. There you go, Ken. That was what your mom Is had, right? That's pretty good. Well, it's almond eggnog. Yeah. It's still it's still got egg in it. Egg whites. <laughs> it's oh, almond yeah. milk True. and mung bean uh, egg replacement. <laughs> Yum. Hummus nog. <laughs> sounds terrible. Oh, here's a quick nail story, by the way. When Colleen and I we, were... We like, know. We wait for it all time. <laughs> did I tell this? I think I brought it up. Did once. you? Yeah. When Colleen, tell it again. I'll when, hear it again. When Colleen and I were first dating, she was like, oh, you don't, you don't ever, uh, you don't really cook. And I was like, well, I only know how to make like grilled cheese 
and scrambled eggs and other things. And then she's like, I love omelets. And I was like, oh, okay, I think I can make you an omelet. And she was eating a lot of like, you know, green peppers and like healthy things or whatever, but we didn't have any of that. And I was like, man, I wonder if there'd be an interesting taste to throw some hummus in that omelet. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and it was just the most disgusting thing. But she ate it and she stomached it. And then Whoa. afterwards, oh, she was like, just it. so you know, you can't put hummus in an, in an omelet. That is... Bless her heart. Yeah. Texturally, that sounds awful. It was. It was. I, awful. You know what? You tried to be nice. So I know. omelets are yummy. Hummus is yummy. I'm down for it. Yeah. yeah. He so has been on that an counts. omelet kick recently. Oh, you're. On, yeah. Maybe you should try an, uh, a hummus omelet then, Kevin. <laughs> I know. Not, I, I think I've been inspired. Not recommended. <laughs> send us a uh, video of uh, any any fans want to send us a video trying a hummus omelet, and we'll send you uh, nothing. <laughs> So do you just like, did you just, sla- so you cook the omelet and then did you just slap it on or did you like mix it in with the omelet? Mix? I, I did oh, half and half. I put God. some in, <laughs> some in the omelet. The worst answer you could have. If you imagine so I put some in the omelet. Make sure the hummus taste got through, of course. I, yeah, I had to make sure it was in there. And then if you imagine sort of like a uh, Light en- enchilada or whatever, where they put the cheese on top, but that yeah. put the hummus on top. Oh, God. It was oh, I bet your drizzling was great, though. Thank Chef you. Chef Neil. Thank you. <laughs> My, I'm a hummus bay. That's what I am. Yeah. <laughs> Just slapping Slowly it on. Slowly dribbles down. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Question seven. What was the colloquial name for the Native American Party, later known by the American Party? This political group was an anti-Catholic, xenophobic uh, group and counted among its members John Wilkes Booth. The name would be right at home in the Game of Thrones universe. So what do we think? Lannister, uh, oh, yeah. Stark. Yeah. No. Um, <clears throat> who are the fish people? Uh, Pike. Pike. There are no fish people. Well, you know what I mean. Um, oh, Greyjoy. Great joy. It's like on the tip of my tongue because they say it in... <laughs> sorry. National Treasure. <laughs> they All say right. it in National Treasure. Right, well, let's keep going. He goes... Uh, Tyrell. National Treasure. Maybe. Yeah. Something like that because Nicholas Cage goes, oh, John Wilkes Booth. It, um, it's not the Freemasons. Yeah, John Wilkes Booth. Yeah, I'm trying to get in his head. <laughs> He's a member of a secret society. I can't. Yeah. So, question seven. Um, fitting in in the Game of Thrones world, we were thinking last names: Stark, Lannister, Martell, stuff like that. But we settled on like Direwolf, maybe. So we locked uh, in with Direwolf. Okay. We were having trouble over here. Uh, Jeff might correct me if I'm wrong. I thought they mentioned this in National Treasure when he talks about Wilkes Booth being like an underclover, underclover. <laughs> the old underclover the lover. Clover. There's a field of clovers and they were right. under it. The underclover lover of Donald Clover. Uh, so, <laughs> um, and so we didn't know. And I, Knights of Templar kind of sounded familiar um, and then some sort of Latin phrase, but we went with officially Knights of Templar. All right. And unfortunately, uh, this is the Know Nothing Party. So it wasn't necessarily mm-hmm. a name. It was more of a common catchphrase. Oh, Know Nothing. Yeah, know know Nothing. Yep. Oh, yeah. That's a... All right. All right. Similarly, Great National Treasure. We know shout, out. shout out to National Treasure, though. <laughs> yeah, see? He understands. National All Treasure 3. Knowledge he's pandering. <laughs> <laughs> he's pandering. That's fine. I feel good. Question eight. Um, a manufacturer of aftermarket lenses for Apple iPhones, a physics expression defined as the product of a distance and another physical quantity, such as force, what word was originally used to mean one fortieth of an hour or 90 seconds? Uh, there are aftermarket lenses they make for iPhone. I don't think it's going to be this, though, but I think it starts with an M. Um, they make anamorphic lenses for the iPhone, but it, it's like mo- not motion, moto. I can't remember. It could be motion. Motion. Micro micro let's go with micro i don't i like that it's really hard it is really hard that's what she said uh you guys are up yeah right. so we we're kind of struggling here um but we know that distance i think distance times force is like work slash energy so i think we we're locking in with work so i'm like oh, yeah we're not happy about it but <laughs> yeah we'll lock in with that for now yeah we didn't get too far either we just said micro as right. a guess. And uh, Neil was on to something when he said it starts with an M. Um, the product of a distance and another physical quantity, example force, and all of the other ones are all examples of moments. All right. Let's move on from that catastrophe. Question number <laughs> nine. The physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living is an art installation by Damien Hirst featuring a shark preserved in formaldehyde. This piece is one of the most notable winners of what prize, which has been awarded by the Tate Gallery in Britain every year since 1991. The prize is named for a famous English painter and not a Cincinnati-born U.S. media mogul. Oh, I think I know it. I think I know it, too. All right, let's lock in. Okay. 
Where did this come up? We just heard this. One of our friends told us that she had to study the shark preserved in formaldehyde. And she was like, yeah, his name's Damien Hurst, in case that ever comes up as a question. But what award did it win? Okay, a painter. Um, Cincinnati mogul. What's a media mogul? Like, just any... I got oh, nothing. I got nothing. Um, got anything? I would just say James, but no, I have nothing. nothing. Okay, Don't we'll go with James. Okay. And the jazz? I think we're going to go with uh, Turner. Uh, you're, you're talking about the movie with Rat Tail, right? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Turner? Yeah. yeah, I think it's for Turner, yeah. But it's interesting she said that the artist's name was Hearst because mm-hmm. there's also William Randolph Hearst, who's a, another media mogul, but we went with Turner. Mm-hmm. And uh, the media mogul that I was talking about uh, formed such companies as CNN. He's from Cincinnati, but famously associated with Atlanta, Ted Turner. Mm. Oh, nice work, guys. The Hearst you were talking yeah. about, I believe, is H-E-A-R-S-T, and this Damien Hearst yeah. is H-U-R-S-T. Okay. Just, Just a weird mm-hmm. coincidence yeah. about media moguls. Yeah. When, tripped at the finish line there. When you first yeah. said Cincinnati media mogul, I thought first for a very split second, uh, Jerry Springer, but it went away. <laughs> right. And last, last question. question in the round. Uh, in December 1932, uh, Marian Rajewski, a Polish mathematician and cryptanalyst, broke the message keys of the Enigma machine. Unfortunately, he and his fellow Polish cryptanalysts ran out of money while trying to keep up with German advances to the machine. Famously, it was the British, most notably with the assistance of Alan Turing, who built a bomb effective enough to reliably decrypt messages. Alan Turing died in 1954 of an apparent suicide from cyanide ingestion. Which company logo is often erroneously rumored to reflect the manner of Turing's death, despite the designer and CEO's refutation of that? What? Wow. Um, this so, is a Neil game that you're writing here. I did. Yeah, I did a little bit of that. <laughs> what company's logo reflects the manner in which Alan Turing died, although they say it's not an homage to him? Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're locked in. We're thinking Apple because I think apple seeds have trace amounts of cyanide. So if you took a bite out of an apple, obviously it wouldn't be the seeds, but maybe that's what they're thinking. I love it. We're in. No, so no, we're going no, with no Apple. We're yeah, we think maybe sprinkled a little bit on an apple like uh, Snow White and uh, then went down into the, the <laughs> <laughs> what is it, the basement <laughs> laughing. Uh, yeah, we said apple. Um, so he had a half-eaten apple uh, next to him when he was found uh, to be poisoned with cyanide. Uh, whether it's a suicide or not is partially up for question. Uh, apple said originally in their design that the bite was to show that it was an apple and not a cherry. So that was... Uh, People often think that it's an homage to Turing, given that they're a computer company. I think they would have figured out that it's an apple and not a cherry, since the company's called Apple. But <laughs> they wanted funny. a they wanted a logo that didn't need words. If so. they were looking, I could take a bite out of a cherry like that, a little tiny bite. <laughs> if they were looking uh, for some suspects, they should have looked for those uh, pesky penguins. Penguins. <laughs> <laughs> what are our scores? <laughs> Uh, all right, looks like we picked up uh, an extra 20 points there, Ken. So we should be at 50, I think, to end the round. Cool. And flu game? Uh, yeah, we're at 40. 40. 40. All right, hanging tight. So before we go to the swing round, uh, Jeff, uh, you always like to uh, talk about Patreon and how much we appreciate our Patreon supporters. And we have two here in the studio with us today, but why don't you just give a few well, words? Uh, over Skype. Over Skype. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> yes, in the studio via a television. Um, no, Did you I, not get the teleportation device that we sent you in the mail? I don't think no. it's in our mailbox. It's, it's our new <laughs> highest tier Patreon back. perk. Yeah. So you can just arrive in studio for recording. Just take the pill. Don't worry about it. We can't guarantee your particles you. will come back together. But right. yeah, we're not sure it'll still be you, but worth a shot. Yeah. But we do really appreciate the support of our patrons. They are the entire reason that our show continues to grow and thrive. We are... Um, always looking to expand and grow our patron perks. If you would like to support us at any level, uh, please check us out there. Patreon.com slash triviality podcast. We say there's something for everybody. And I'm telling you, we want to bring you guys as much content as possible, as many shows as possible. In order to do that, we need to free up a little time. Um, if, if you've been thinking about donating, you know, just a dollar, a dollar a month. Mm -hmm. That's all it takes to help us out and, uh, maybe try to make this career, you know? Yeah, and uh, as far as our content, as Ken said, um, with bonus episodes, not including Patreon bonuses, but we're almost at 200 episodes of bonus and regular episodes, uh, far past it with Patreon bonuses. But with uh, our normal episodes, I think today might be around the 200th. So pretty cool. 200 episodes in almost, what, three years, right? Yeah, it'll be three years in a couple months. So thanks to all of our uh, patron supporters who have carried us this far. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And let's get the uh, swing round.
All right. So today's swing round is uh, Ah Real Monsters. <laughs> this is uh, partly inspired by Misinformation's Dictator December. What I'm going to give you is the uh, country and their years of rule. And I just want you to tell me who the dictator despot monster was. Okay. So, are they really monsters? Uh, some of these or are. Or is it, or quite is it even scarier that they're humans themselves? And that will be on another podcast. It's the Monster Inside. The Monster Inside, hosted by <laughs> Triviality. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Jeff. I don't like that. That would be good for Jeff to host something like that since he's always g- giving Hi, us negative information. He just starts off the podcast with a complete downer right away. 17,000 lives were lost that day. <laughs> The koala population is currently... Oh, wow. God. Wow. <laughs> nah. All right, let's go. All right, so the first one is uh, Spain, and the years are 1939 to 1975. Number two, uh, Chile, a uh, politician who ruled as dictator from 73 to 1990. Third one here, first leader of North Korea, ruled from 1948 until their death in 1994. Number four, a Yugoslav communist revolutionary and statesman serving various roles from 1943 until 1980, started as president in 1953. Number five, affectionately known as Papa Doc. This was the president of Haiti from 1957 to 1971. Number six, Cambodian revolutionary and politician governed Cambodia as the prime minister from 1976 to 1979. Number seven, the first czar of Russia, 1547 to 1584. Number eight, a Ugandan military officer and strongman who served as president from 71 to 1979. Number nine, North Vietnamese revolutionary and politician serving as prime minister of North Vietnam from 1945 to 1955, and then its president from 1945 to 1969. And number 10, King of the Belgians from 1865 to 1909. Okay, well, we've poured over this depressing, depressing category for a good uh, 15 minutes, I'd I say. I'd expect nothing less This from first me. one's killing me, uh, but uh, let's get the questions one more time. We'll see how we did. All right. First one, Spain, ruler from 1939 to 1975. Yeah, I had every, like, Spanish slash Italian sounding F name rattling through my brain during this time. Because I'm like, it's like right on the tip of my tongue. But we settled on Franco. Go ahead. No, Isabella the second. And the correct answer is Francisco Franco. Whoa. Oh, yeah. nice, nice pull. That was just me going through the alphabet. I knew it was a double F name. Francisco Franco. That was so hard to watch. We yeah. said both names just yep. randomly. Yeah. I'm glad you got there. Thanks. Number two, Chilean general and politician ruled from 73 to 1990. No idea here, so uh, tapping. Yeah, tapping. Well, we might embarrass ourselves, but we just said Che Guevara. All right, not Che Guevara. Uh, it is Augusto Pinochet. Okay. Is that a wine? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a good wine. I can I use a glass of that right now. <laughs> sounds pretty good. <laughs> All right, the third one here. Leader of North Korea, first leader, uh, ruled from 1948 to 1994. Okay, so this is Kim Jong Il's dad, and I remember, I remember it gets the name gets a little scrambled, and there's a new part to it. So you got Kim Jong Un, Kim Jong Il, and I think this is Kim Il Sook. Yeah, we knew it was whoever was before Kim Jong Il, but we had nothing, so we just said Kim Jong Il. It is Kim Il Sung. Oh, mm. oh. good, good reason. It really okay. hurts. Okay. 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 Okay, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> Number four, a Yugoslav communist revolutionary statesman serving in various roles, including president from 1953 until the death in 1980. No idea. And since this is a dictator category, we can't even come up with joke answers. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so tap. We said Ivan the Terrible. Uh, this is uh, Joseph Tito. Okay. Not a member of the Jackson oh. Five. <laughs> I've heard of Tito. Uh, number five. This one I know was a little hard, so I gave you the nickname Papa Doc. President of Haiti from 1957 to 1971. Yeah, I might have been able to get it if we just had to get Papa Doc, but I, I don't know his real name. I know you're thinking about pizza, Neil. Go ahead and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> thinking about Papa John. Pa- Papa, Doc, Papa Doc ate 30 pizzas in 30 days. He's not even in the pizza category. Sorry. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> 
Yeah, so th- at this point in the list, we started just going through really good villains or whatnot. So we put uh, Dr. Octavius for this one. Ooh. Papa Doc Ock. Oh, that's like awesome. It. Uh, it is <laughs> Francois Duvalier. <sighs> ah, of course. That's a great bourbon. <laughs> this is the this is the round that's going to get us kicked off of uh, podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. All right. Uh, number six, Cambodian revolutionary politician who governed Cambodia as prime minister from 1976 to 1979. Thanks for this one, Pol Pot. Yeah, um, the name Greg just kept coming to mind throughout our entire little brainstorming session, so we just put Greg. <laughs> Old Greg. And the correct answer on this, uh, the jazz have it, it is Pol Pot. Nice. Mm. It's going really well. I hear that's legal in Illinois now. God, I'm, I just feel this so round, good. We're, we're in trouble. We are. We're in big trouble. This is the last month of getting uh, Patreon sponsorships, yeah. I think. Nah. Number seven. The first czar of Russia, 1547 to 1584. Uh, we had a first czar of Russia question at Trivia the other day. I can't remember if it was Ivan or Nicholas or Peter, but we went with Peter. Yeah, we went with uh, Nicholas. So see how that goes part of the impetus for this round uh named the terrible this was ivan oh my sweetness i said i should have just written ivan the terrible for anything we didn't know number eight ugandan military officer served as president of uganda from 71 to 79 pretty sure there was a movie he was mentioned in so i would guess since there was a movie neil yeah the only one i knew i just assumed that this was forrest whitaker's oscar-winning portrayal uh in the last king of scotland of Idi amin so that's what we went with we said voldemort (laughs) <laughs> it is in fact Edie I mean finally one question I got from a movie that's all I knew so uh, number nine North Vietnamese revolutionary politician prime minister from 45 to 55 and then president on till 69 this is this one was really bothering us too because we put Ho Chi Minh that's a city it might be his name too but I don't think that's it but what we'll see we put mother Gothel it is Ho Chi Minh. Is it? Oh, thank yeah. God. Whoa! Dang! <laughs> so the city was named after... Because that's originally Saigon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. the city was named after Ho Chi Minh. Yeah, we should have just named a city. That would have been a good idea. And I think the last one, 10, is objectively the hardest. Uh, King of the Belgians from 1865 to 1909. Hans Waffelman. I was just going to say Waffelman. That's funny. And oh, we that's put so... a different Hans. Uh, shout out to Alan Rickman. Uh, Hans Grubert. <laughs> 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 Uh, responsible for decimating a lot of Central Africa. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Central Africa. This was Leopold II. Oh, yeah. Ho, ho, ho. Now I have a country. <sighs> no. <laughs> what are we going to do with it? How am I going to edit this round, guys? <laughs> I like it, uh, we'll but see. I agree with you. It's probably not airable. <laughs> <laughs> so some of it's got to air. You so, got a backup swing round. <laughs> so let me just uh, let me just issue my apologies now. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing, didn't know what we were getting into. So oh, lack of seriousness uh, meets a little bit of seriousness. We tried to come up with the right answers. Yeah, it was just too too hard. Okay, so we got uh, twenty points on that round. How about you guys? That would be a that's Where? wait. Grab the calculator. Zero. Yeah. Zero. We got a zero. Okay. Man. <laughs> All right. So following that swing round, rather rather brutal. Sorry about that. Uh, More ways than one. Indeed. Uh, The Jazz have the lead currently with 70 points, uh, over 40 points for MJ's flu game. Okay. Round two. Question one. You wouldn't be lost if while visiting which famous world city, you checked the weather on your phone, only to see that you were in paradise, an unincorporated town. I don't know. Let's just name name a world city. Paradiso popped in my head, but I don't know if that's actually a place. I love it. We're going with it. Locked in. All right. Paradiso. Don't know if that's a place. And we said uh, Lost was shot in Hawaii, so maybe it's uh, Honolulu. Was Mm -hmm. shot in Hawaii. Uh, I believe it was shot on uh, Kauai. Um, But the uh, famously unincorporated, um, because of its ties originally to organized crime, gambling, Las Vegas... Is oh. not where you think it is. So most of the strip and all of the attractions in Las Vegas oh, are actually in an unincorporated town by the name of Paradise. God, he Dang. said he t- he told us this like five times when we were in Vegas. Except I was too busy rolling dice to pay any attention. Yeah, yeah. The whole Bugsy Siegel. I was thinking about my my hundreds of dollars. <laughs> yep. Question two. At the beginning of HBO's Watchmen, yeah, uh, it opens on the scene of what race riot, also known as the Greenwood Massacre. It's been called the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. 
The attack, carried out on the ground and from private aircraft, destroyed more than 35 square blocks of a district that at the time was the wealthiest black community in the United States. It was also known as Black Wall Street. Um, there were riots in L.A., but... I don't think so. But yeah, let's just go with it. Los Angeles. Shout out, L.A. All right. Los Angeles. Okay. I think it's uh, Tulsa. I think I heard about it on NPR yeah, recently. Yeah, I think he's right. Yep. Uh, Greenwood Massacre, uh, I believe that was 1921, also known as the Tulsa Race Riot. Mm. I still need to watch Watchmen. Question number three. If Harry and Meghan were really allowed to leave the royal family, it would remove Harry and Archie from the line of succession. If this were to happen, who would secede the British throne if Louis were not able to ascend? All right. Uh, our team over here, DJ Utah Jazz, uh, we talked about it a lot. And we just, our heads blew up. So we're going to tap, actually. <laughs> so feel free to talk. We were running through a lot of different names. And I, I feel like if the, I think Charles was actually the first person who was in line. But I could be wrong. But we just said, you want to do first or second? That's, I think you have it right. Let's do second. All right. We're saying Charles the second in case one exists. Yeah. So we finally figured out what this question was asking. And it's who's a, who's after Harry and Archie, basically. Mm-hmm. So we just said Fergie. Not the not the musician, but the, You're talking the, about the, the British the one. The Duchess of York? Yeah. Uh, it would actually be her husband, Andrew of York. Mm-hmm. So uh, it would go oh. Charles and then William and William's three kids, which would be George, Charlotte, and Louis. After that, it would go in the same generation. It would go back up to Harry and then it would have been Archie. But if they're eliminated, it goes then back up a generation to Andrew. Does he go by Drew or Andy? He feels like an Andy to me. Okay. That'd be great. Let's go up to him. Andy hey. of York. Yeah. Andy. I've actually met him. He goes by Drew. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> but he it's feels really like an Andy. Andy. All right. Question number four. Bill Cartwright. Hold on one second. What are you drinking out of right now? Oh, so I saw this on Amazon. It's this big ass mug, and I just love drinking out of really large objects. So. Oh, me too. What's on? What is that? Camouflage. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I can't see it it that well. Yeah, and it comes with a beer opener on the side too. Wow. Oh, that's cool. That is something else. How many ounces though? That's (laughs) what we. The people want to know how many ounces. Nice mug. Fifty-two actually. Fifty-two ounces. Wow. You just fill that up. And then refill it one, uh, refill it just like the bottom, mm-hmm. and he's got all of his water for the day. There you go. Yep, you're set. All right. Question four: Bill Cartwright is among the notable people who did not get stuck in which Northern California city? It's known for its wineries and has been called the Zinfandel Capital of the World. Although John Fogarty would probably not know because he never went there in the first place. I mean, we gotta get this one. <laughs> What's this hand motion, Neil? Are you, are you muting? What are you doing? Yeah, no, we can. I know it. I, um, he's doing this hand motion like he's singing that some more. Summoning, <laughs> summoning the answer from you there, Ken. Oh, uh, right. Okay, we are locked in over here. All right, we're we talked two. about Sonoma. I feel like there's some. I feel like there's. A, I want to get that clue, but I don't think it's gonna come to me. All right, I'm sure we could just do that. Okay, we'll just lock in with Napa Valley. Yeah, this is something I'm gonna take after we record. It's a Napa. Ken, um, how many CCR songs do you know that aren't about the South? Uh, all of them, technically. Anything about Lodi, California? No. Stuck in old Lodi again? I don't know that one. Yeah, the answer is Lodi. Lodi. Mm. Doesn't sound familiar to you? All right, it does not. All right, before weird. we move on to the next <laughs> question, I'm going to take a quick shot at the cursed can here. Oh, you got it. Got it. You're like four feet away from it. I know. <laughs> it's cursed, though. It is cursed. Question five. While not its most common application... Which song, with lyrics from a poem written by Robert Burns, is often sung at funerals, graduations, and as a farewell or ending to other occasions? It's also, weirdly, often played in Japanese stores before closing. This is Semisonic's uh, closing time. <laughs> closing, <laughs> closing time. <laughs> hey, should I meet my untimely demise? I want you to make sure that Semisonic's closing time is played at my funeral. As I, like, drop the lid on the casket? Yeah. Oh, okay, so then that would be New Year's then. Is the most common, but it can also be used at funerals, at graduations, and closing time for Japanese stores. <laughs> sure. I, I kind of like old, old When design. I was in Japan, I didn't stay till uh, closing time in the stores because I was like, didn't want to, you know, overstep my bounds. Jeff exclusively only goes into Japanese stores five minutes right before close. <laughs> <laughs> I just need one thing real quick. I'm going to pop in and out. Uh, do you want you want to do old lang syne? Yeah. Okay. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we, we kept singing the song. We don't really know the, the uh, 
title of it, but we're going to go with Friends Forever, maybe is what it's called. So Vitamin, I guess it's Vitamin the one that goes C? like as we go on. Yeah, so we'll go with Friends Forever. That's called the graduation song, right? Vitamin C? Yeah, vitamin C. Is it? We sang that, I think, in my eighth grade graduate. Well, if that's, if that's the answer, they still get credit. Uh, but we went with Old Lang Syne, mm-hmm. the New Year's song, yeah. as we most read, readily know it. Yep, the song predates the poem, but the poem was written, I believe, in the 1780s by Robert Burns. It is Old Lang Syne. Nice. nice mm-hmm. one. Uh, so it looks like after five questions here in the second round, we picked up uh, an extra 20 points. So we're at, we're at what, 90 now? I believe. Yeah. All right. 90 to... F- uh, what did you guys pick up over there? Anything? I think zero. Yes. Zero. Okay. <laughs> tough. still it's at 40. Oosh. It is a tough round for everyone. We just need one to pick up the momentum. We're right in this. This, this is a Jeff game. Don't forget, guys. Yeah. This basically, right. Jeff, game. Jeff games, you always have to multiply by times two for your real score. Oh, sweet. 80. Solid score. Yeah. Question number six. In 2012, only one sports team was worth more than $2 billion. Today, there are 52 sports teams with a worth of more than $2 billion. Uh, with more trophies than any other club in English football with a record 20 league titles, 12 FA Cups, and 5 League Cups, which team, now ranked third in overall value, was the first team to reach $2 billion in value? They are nicknamed the Red Devils. Hey, we're locked in. Uh, I think we are, yeah. too. Yeah. Do you mean? No, let's go. Okay, we're going with Manchester United. Yep, that's what we thought. Yep, Man U, Manchester United. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I believe balls. Real Madrid now. We them boys. Uh, I believe it's Real Madrid now as mm. the highest value team with uh, more than four point five billion in valuation. Yeah. That's nuts. I think, I think the Dallas Cowboys are actually worth like five billion dollars right now. They have so much I money, but they they ghost their coaches. They don't even let them know they're fired. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Question seven. Baiju is the world's most popular spirit, with ten billion liters sold each year almost entirely in China. What is the second most popular spirit in the world with more than 5 billion liters sold worldwide? What about what about just like a really popular vodka? Brand? Well, the most popular vodka, surprising, I remember I wrote a question of it, was Smirnoff, which seems American, but that was the most popular one in Russia, so I don't know if that's worldwide. Maybe we should go with that. Okay. If it's popular with Russians and yeah. and sorority girls, right? then there's got to be a lot of, a lot of popularity in between, right? Yeah. All right, let's go with that. Okay. We tossed around a bunch of different alcohols and weren't really sure on any, so we just said vodka. Okay. We went with a brand of vodka and said Smirnoff. Uh, with 5 billion liters sold is vodka, which I will give you Smirnoff. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think Smirnoff's the most like sold of the vodkas. It okay. is. Yeah. yeah. But it's spirit non-brand specific. Okay. Yep. Question number eight. Uh, unfortunately, and this was a statistic I found recently that absolutely shocked me, uh, black women in the United States die in childbirth roughly at the same rate as women in which country whose capital is Ulan Bator? A little bit more depression from coming from <laughs> Yeah, in case here. there wasn't enough. Oh. We're just kind of throwing out some countries, um, and we landed on Indonesia. Okay. Um, yeah, we were just kind of trying to think, um, of some countries because this capital does not ring a bell we just we were just kind of saying different country names and neil said cambodia and i said oh, you know yeah we had that one down too i said you know something ulan bator does kind of have that cadence of some of the cambodian you know names of locations that i've heard of so we went with cambodia um cambodia i, I think it's uh Phnom fen is the capital mm, and fen, jakarta yeah. for indonesia yeah. uh it is oh, mongolia yeah. oh hmm Okay. So what we're was it? way off. Mongolia. Oh, okay. Number nine. Smashing records, no babies born in Britain in 2016 were named what? It's possible there could have been one or two of these. The ONS only reports names with three or more instances. Maybe it had to do with the resentment over the UKIP leader who came to power that year. Okay. I think we're locked in. Okay. We need so, a little time. What do you think? No babies named this in 2016. Mm-hmm. Boris Johnson. <laughs> just name British people. Could be Boris. Should you say, I don't think that's it, but I mean, I got nothing else. Sure. I love it. All right. We just said Boris. Okay. So Boris uh, for Boris Johnson, and we said the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Neil, could you say smashing for me? Smashing. Oh, uh, Nigel. Nigel. Nigel Farage Nigel. was the UKIP oh. leader I was referencing, and there were no babies born in 2016 named Nigel. Wow. Which seems like a super British name. Yeah. Which means there was no smashing. 
Oh, there was. They just didn't name them Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> and now for something completely different. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, number 10. Last question in the round. At the time of recording, there are 12 teams that have never won a Super Bowl. It's still possible for this to change by the time the episode has released if the Tennessee Titans can win the Super Bowl this year. As of the 2019, well, this season's divisional round, three teams were in the running which have never won, which two teams were eliminated in the divisional rounds last week at the time of recording without have never won a Super Bowl. Okay, I'm leaving it to Neil. Yep, I got the other one. Okay, we're good. We are locked in. I'm thinking the Houston Texans who played the Chiefs and then the Minnesota Vikings would be my two. I didn't even think about the... Uh... Wait, what was the first team you said? Texans. The Houston Texans, yeah. I think. Yeah, so Houston Texans for sure. We had them. And then Ken said the Bills, which I agreed with. But I also remember, I don't think the Vikings won one. And maybe the Bills did, even though they lost a million of them. Uh, but yeah, we said Texans and Bills. And it is the Houston Texans and the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah. Nice. What I did? didn't mean to say that with so much surprise in my voice. Sorry. <laughs> okay, they can edit that out, actually. They can make the voice. It'll be like... Nice. Yeah. Classic robot voice. I'm trying to remember right. when the Bills would have won. They're pretty early on. Yeah, they won in the... Yeah, I think Jim Kelly. Yeah. I yeah. Think he's gone. In the 80s, was that? No, I thought he I thought he never won one. He always lost. Oh, yeah. He lost like six or something. Yeah, you might be right. They did okay. win one, though. They did win one? Yeah. Okay. Going into the final round, we've got the Utah Jazz leading 110. That's like a basketball score. Mm -hmm. Over uh, MJ's flu game with 70. Maybe Not college so basketball. Grandma basketball score. <laughs> Maybe college basketball. <laughs> so let me get you your final round categories. Uh, the final uh, categories are all based on Spielberg snubs. Uh, so every single one of these categories is going to be uh, a movie that beat a Spielberg movie uh, that he produced for uh, okay, so, Oscars. So Gandhi. Oh, man. That Neil look. Yes. <laughs> uh, so your first category is Gandhi. Mm -hmm. uh, your second category is Shakespeare in Love. Chariots of Fire. Your third one, I went with Crash. Okay. Uh, your fourth category is Argo. Mm -hmm. And your last category, The Shape of Water. Oh, okay. And the wagers are locked in. Your first question is courtesy of 1982. That was the year Gandhi beat E.T. Uh, question one. Mother to Rajiv Gandhi, himself a prime minister of India, Indira Gandhi was the first and to date only female prime minister of India. Both Indira and her son were part of a powerful Indian political dynasty, which stemmed not from Mahatma Gandhi, as they are of no relation, but of what founding figure and first prime minister of India? Oh, this is easy. All right, next. <laughs> uh, we'll skip Give over me a 1980. Hard one this time. We'll skip over 1985, where uh, Out of Africa beat the color purple. <laughs> <laughs> to 1998, that was when Shakespeare and Love beat Saving Private Ryan. Question two. All the world a stage is a famous line from the Shakespeare play As You Like It. This line is adapted and expanded in what 1981 Rush song off the album Moving Pictures, which discusses the surreal nature of performing. Number three, courtesy of 2005, that was the year Crash Beat Munich. Ugh, that's the worst one. Yeah. <laughs> that's, well, that's worse than Shakespeare Love versus Private Ryan. Number three. On March 27, 1977, two Boeing 747 passenger jets operating KLM Flight 4805 and Pan Am Flight 1736 collided on the runway at Los Rodeos Airport, now Tenerife North Airport, on the island of Tenerife. Tenerife is the largest and most populated island in the Canaries, which are a part of which nation? All right, so we'll skip over 2006. That was when The Departed beat Letters from Iwo Jima. 2011, The Artist beat Warhorse. <laughs> on to 2012, where Argo beat Lincoln. Number four. Argo is a 2012 American historical film directed by Ben Affleck. The screenplay was adapted from the book uh, by the USCI operative Tony Mendez, uh, called The Master of Disguise, and a 2007 Wired article by Joshua Behrman called The Great Escape, how the CIA, CIA used a fake sci-fi trick to rescue Americans from Tehran. This deals with the hostage crisis stemming from 1979 to 1981 in Iran, who was the president during this hostage crisis? You put an Iwo Jima there because he was producer on this? That one? Yeah, his okay. producer credit. Yep. Okay. That is correct. Uh, we'll skip over 2015. Uh, Bridge of Spies lost a spotlight. <laughs> Just crushing Neil right now. 
2017, where the post lost the shape of water. That's fine. In question five. I'm not saying they're all snubs. I just thought it was funny to torture Neil. Water is one of the most abundant substances on Earth, but it's also found in a number of other places, surprisingly, including mercury. On Earth, most of the fresh water is found in the atmosphere in the form of water vapor as a part of the hydrological cycle. There is a moon in our solar system that behaves in much the same way, having rivers, rivers, lakes, all driven by liquid methane. On what moon, named for the pre-Olympian gods of Greek mythology, would you find this occurring? Okay. We will consider these answers and be back with a catastrophe on our hands. Yeah, <laughs> it's not looking good. All right. All of the answers are locked in. First question was about Gandhi. So, mother to Rajiv Gandhi, uh, himself a prime minister of India, Indira Gandhi, was the first and only female prime minister of India to date. Both she and her son were part of a powerful political Indian dynasty, stemming not from the Gandhi you all know and think of, as they are of no relation, but what founding fi- uh, figure and first prime minister of India? No idea, so we put Ben Kingsley. And what did you wager? 20. Unfortunately. Clue game? <laughs> all right. We wagered five, and... I'm hoping I'm not just making up words, but I'm just going to go with it. Uh, Ashwara, which I think I just made up, but... I think that's a thing. I don't know what it references. Um, I believe he's in the film, Gandhi. Uh, this is Nehru. Okay. Jawala or mm-hmm. Nehru. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, I, I believe that. Question number two about Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. All the world a stage is a famous line from the Shakespeare play, As You Like It. The line is adapted and expanded in what 1981 Rush song off the album Moving Pictures which discusses the surreal nature of performing. Uh, yeah, we just went with YYZ for this one, and we wagered 20. Yeah, and we, we channel a little I Love You Man, because we're not the, too familiar with all Rush songs, so we just had Tom Sawyer. And we wagered five. All right, and this is the Rush song Limelight. That was about, mm. We were singing it, I just didn't know the name of it. Yeah, yeah all about mm-hmm. performing. Yeah, Jobin. That makes sense. <laughs> um. Question number three is about a very famous and actually the most deadly plane crash. Um, I wanted to know uh, Tenerife, the largest and most populated of the Canary Islands, uh, are a part of which nation? We said the UK or England, I guess, for 20 points. We wagered 10. We also said the UK, but if we have to be more specific, England. Yeah, we did UK slash England. Uh, You would not have to be more specific. Uh, It is, in fact, Spain. Shucks. Oh, Oh, my. (laughs) And decimated here. (laughs) (laughs) Question four uh, was about the film Argo, basically surrounding the plot. Uh, Who was the president of the United States during the Iran hostage crisis from 1979 to 1981? Yeah, this one, I think I know. Uh, We went with Carter for 20 points. My great, great uncle. Not really. Jimmy Carter. For five. (laughs) For five. (laughs) Uh, Jimmy Carter is correct. Yay. Woohoo. They can't all be brutal. They can. Mm, They can. (laughs) (laughs) And question number five was about the shape of water, or rather things that take the shape of their containers. Uh, Water is the most, one of the most abundant substances on Earth. Um, It's comprised mostly in the atmosphere, surprisingly, as a part of the hydrological cycle, which moon in our solar system behaves in a similar way, having rivers and lakes of liquid methane, named for the Greek uh, pre-Olympian gods of Greek mythology. Uh, the pre-Olympian gods were Titans, so I guess it's Titan. That and what'd you wager? What it is? Yeah, uh, um, for another, another twenty. Um, yeah, that that sounds about right. Uh, we wagered ten on this one, and we said Io. Um, and the Jazz are correct. It is Titan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Damn. For the That's Olymp- smart. pre-Olympian <laughs> Titans. All right, so it was a um, harder game than I expected, but that's usually how it goes for me. Uh, the Flu game ended with a score of 45, uh, but with a whopping 90 points. This week's a whopping 90. cream of the crop <laughs> is uh, is the Utah Jazz. You know that I'm the cream of the crop. Yay. DJ Utah Jazz. Yeah, we couldn't even break 100. We couldn't overcome the flu today. <laughs> that's par for the course. No, that's you guys did great. Uh, you were a lot of fun on the show, and we appreciate you, uh, you coming on and, and also supporting the show. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Yeah, it was really fun. Yeah, great time. <laughs> come, come, come back sometime for a rematch, for, for a real game. Oh, we'd love. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Anyone you like to give a shout out to or anything? Yeah, our trivia partner Derek. Um, Hi, Derek. What's yeah. up, Derek? That's about it. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. 
All right, guys. Oh, yeah, thanks. We'll give a shout out to Matt too. We'll, uh, yeah. yeah, wherever yeah. Matt Hi, may Matt. be. Yeah, he's gonna be bringing us some new pots. He's surfing right now. Yeah, or whatever. <laughs> What do we say? That's all we That's do here. He's at the he's at the Rachel uh, Ray oh, Rachel Ray factory. Right. He's going to bring us a nice uh, steam pot cooker. All right. So a big thank you again to Christina and Kevin for joining us today. Uh, thank you for supporting us on Patreon as Cruiserweight Champions. And on behalf of Ken, Neil, and myself, that was Triviality. Was, that was you that I one day asked, what does au pair mean? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, and it's not just Jeff Longley looking at a piece of fruit. <laughs> <laughs> au pair. <laughs> yeah, <I like> it. <laughs> Glad someone calls him on his stuff. Yeah, thank no, you. I'll cut that out. <laughs>